Hello, everybody. It's Robert Douglas. This is the Deploy Friday webcast that we have every Friday to talk to fascinating people about fascinating technology topics from around the internet. Today, we just concluded the International PHP Conference in Munich, Germany, and I have two participants from that conference here with me today to, to talk about how it was. In fact, um, we have Karsten Windler and uh, Stefan Priebsch, and they were both speakers, uh, multiple times being speakers at that conference. They both gave two sessions, and Karsten even gave the keynote. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, in this conversation, we can not only find out a little bit about the state of PHP and the, the conference and how it was, but also dive into the sessions that you two gentlemen gave at the conference. So welcome, Karsten. Welcome, Stefan. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Carson, do you want to go first and give yourself a little bit of an intro and tell everybody who you are, where you are, and yeah. what your connection to PHP is, aside from having a pur purple elephant on the shelf uh, behind you? The female <laughs> one, yeah. Um, yeah, sure. I'm a, I'm a PHP developer for over 15 years now. Um, started, like, I think PHP 3 was my, my first uh, first uh, version of PHP. And since then, yeah, I, I pretty much stick to PHP, a little bit of JavaScript in between, but not, not worth mentioning. And um, yeah, in recent years, I'm more in the, a little bit more in the managing part, but I still keep on, like I try to be hands-on, have my pet projects, will still uh, checking out the latest development of PHP and, and keeping myself up to date because I'm still, I still love the ecosystem around PHP and everything. So yeah, that's pretty much it for me. I am working at the moment, I'm at the KW Commerce, uh, we are a um, marketplace reseller, so we sell goods well worldwide. And th there I lead the development team where we do the in-house software development. That's awesome. And uh, you're uh, in Germany someplace. Yeah, Berlin. Mm -hmm. Okay, in Berlin. Okay, fantastic. How about you, Stefan? Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Stefan. I'm uh, based in Wolfratshausen, which is south of Munich in Germany. I'm a computer scientist by trade which means that I studied computer science in the last millennium. That makes it sound very long ago. And, and actually the internet and the World Wide Web was not even invented when I started at university. So that's how old I am. <laughs> um, I got dragged into the open source PHP world around the dot-com boom 2000-ish, give or take. And I kind of got stuck there in a positive way. So, um, and, and then I got dragged into that community, did a lot of public speaking. I've published a couple of books. Um, I've lectured in universities. And a couple of years ago, I co-founded a consulting company, which is called the PHP Consulting Company. So guess what we are doing? Uh, we choose the CEO friendly company name, choosing .cc as a top level domain. I, in hindsight, I would not repeat that decision because we sometimes have an email spam related problem, but, but that's already far beyond the introduction. So that's me. And you both just uh, attended the conference in Munich. How was that? What, uh, I mean, what was, what was it like in general? What were your impressions? It was interesting. So for my part, um, I've I've frequently spoken at conferences before that pandemic thing. And then once the pandemic thing came, that went down to zero, which was a, a big shift um, in my life. Because as a consultant, um, speaking at conferences obviously also is a kind of a marketing platform that gives you visibility. And with the lack of that visibility, you're sudden, sudden, somehow that puts you in a, in a challenging position um, economically. And online conferences really are not the same. And then I really enjoy hanging out at the conferences, enjoy interacting with the people. So I, I even though a lot of conferences sort of took place in the big pandemic times, even without the vaccination, I kind of said, said well, I've always been at IPC Munich in, and it's my hometown, so I'll just try and, and I can, at worst case, I can commute, give my talk, and, and leave the place again. And I'll just go there and see how it feels. And I have to say, it was better than I expected, personally. 
it didn't feel really bad or or unsafe but it also felt a little strange it's it's still different than it used to be and and people are not that relaxed people are a little tense people keep their distance so there's not that much interaction um I think it's going to be some time until we get back to where we were before, if we ever get back to that. Yeah, I, I mostly agree. When I had my, my first talk on the IPC in this this summer on the online version of the IPC, and this was, I mean, talking to the camera and just seeing absolutely no reaction. No, just, I don't know. I didn't, when, if even somebody was still listening or not, I had no, no feedback at all. So this was uh, awkward. But still, now and this was, of, of course, for me, a great, great opportunity to speak in front of people. Um, the first time really on a big conference. I spoke on smaller conferences, but I'm not a frequent speaker. So uh, it was a great experience for me. And yeah, I think the, the venue was quite nice. I really liked it there. The, also the catering and everything was cool. But as Stefan mentioned, the whole, everybody was a bit keeping the distance and mask on, mask off. Although I appreciate they had the, the hygiene concept there, it's still it's hard to talk with people through a mask and, and everything. And then and every time you want to pick something from the buffet, you had to get these plastic gloves, which also makes sense. Yeah, to, totally. But it's, it's not the same. So, yeah, I, I hope really that in, in next year, hopefully, then everybody gets gets back to this typical uh, yeah conference setup. Yeah. I can imagine that it injects quite an interesting dynamic when everybody's kind of got the thought in the back of their mind that you can all kill each other. <laughs> well, well with, with a conference combining JavaScript and PHP in a way that had always been the case, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, also, that's true, yeah. I mean, but uh, that's, that's on the other hand, an interesting concept, uh, mixing both up. So maybe, so I, I did not visit uh, I, IJS uh, talk this time but uh, there were interesting ones I, I, maybe i will uh, look at them afterwards like on the online version yeah. well I, I think for those two technologies javascript and php there's more symbiosis between them than at, at any other time in history uh, i mean the number of back end uh, API first systems that are written in PHP and then depend on a view or a react uh, front end of some sort is is growing all the time so uh, to me, it makes sense to put those two together. Uh, it'd be interesting to find out from the conference organizers if they think there was a lot of you know back and forth, or if many Java people like came into the dirty, gross PHP part. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not a big fan of this kind of uh, discussions between the two languages. I, I think in, in the web development world, we should not really do that. That's 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 childish. Uh, yeah, let's the, take the, the best. You mean the, best. You mean the tensions and the knocking each other down, right? Yeah, this yeah. something okay, a bit jokey, but um, I also did a little bit in my in my talk when I uh, showed that JavaScript, at least for some study study I found, is like more energy efficient than PHP. Of course, this hit me hard, but yeah, so, but joking a little bit with it. But when it really gets, yeah, when it gets ugly, then I think it's not not worth it. Let's use the I, tools I would, which we have. I would argue, and and I'm not trying to st start any flame wars here, but maybe that's going to provoke... But you're going to do it anyway. <laughs> so if, if JavaScript is more energy um, efficient than PHP, that may sometimes be compensated by downloading half of the internet via <laughs> NPM before actually executing yeah. code. That, that's another part. That's that's totally true. Yeah, you, do, you, you cannot see it uh, isolated. And that makes the whole thing complicated. But I um, don't want to... Uh, go too too fast now on my talk already. Sorry. I mean, for the record, I am also not very much interested in a conversation of PHP versus JavaScript because they're both well established and have their uses. But a discussion of Composer versus NPM, I would totally pop, I'd buy popcorn for that one because uh, I've always felt Composer is really great and, I, and NPM has often left me wanting to jump off bridges. So maybe just one or two sentences to that. Um, I think, and it, is, it, has, it has often been said that Composer uh, was was one of the most important and best things that would that ever happened to the PHP community because it made it 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 lowered some entry level barrier for people into projects, and that's really great. There is a downside though, 
Composer makes it so easy to add dependencies to your project. And people do that without realizing or thinking enough about the fact that any dependency needs to be managed and mm -hmm. is a long-term liability. Because mm -hmm. at some point you will have to upgrade or your version will not be supported anymore. Or the longer you wait, the more diverse the supported versions and requirements will get. And then it will be difficult to find a matching set of dependencies. And, and may, maybe Carsten will, will add on to that from the, from the uh, eco point of view. But people seem to care too much about the short-term gain and not look at the long-term cost. So Yo, any I just want my code to work happen. right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's complete, I completely agree with, with Stefan here. Uh, my, my talk on the summer IPC was uh, about frameworkless PHP applications. Mm -hmm. So like really going with the bare minimum of what we can use, because I think this, not only from the eco standpoint, uh, that's a totally, yeah, that's of course related, but uh, from, from keeping the systems running, I also had in my past years uh, PHP projects which were so clustered with, with uh, packages that it was so hard to really dig into. And then there was some major version. And basically, this, this whole package did the same thing afterward. It had just had a different API and oh, okay, then you had to really invest a lot of work because of that. And this was... Uh, I agree. You have to be careful with what with what you use, and um, but I think JavaScript is even worse. <laughs> so when when I look well, at my node modules folder, how often I need to delete them, and I see what then gets deleted in there, and it's like what? What did uh, downloading yeah. even more the other half? JavaScript, of JavaScript has no standard library as opposed to PHP. So basically, you're you have to start building your standard library up from scratch through npm. And this is what, what got the whole thing started with downloading half of the internet, as we jokingly refer to it. So there is some sense to that, and there is a history that explains why it is the way. But then if you look at PHP, that has a standard library and has been optimized carefully for its use case, which is powering web-related stuff for years. So there is a lot that years ago some frameworks um, would introduce and now has already been part of the is already part of the language so it becomes easier and easier over time to do things just with a bare language versus via any external packages and and people think i think we need to kind of distinguish and we cannot say well you know javascript is how they do it with the dependencies so it's okay to do the exact same thing in php no it's not because the ecosystem is completely different and I think you can develop um, very good software with very few dependencies. That doesn't mean that you have to write everything yourself, but you should be careful about what you choose. And it doesn't have to be, well, as Carsten said, well, if you just pick something because it has a different API and it doesn't add any real value, it's more of a liability without the benefit. Mm -hmm. More of an attack surface for all sorts of problems later. So let's come back to the conference. Um, <laughs> that is a conversation that I really do enjoy, uh, the differences between uh, package managers. Um, now, I, I made a list of all the talks that the both of you gave, and then I, like a fool, forgot to put your names on them. So which one of you gave the Airport 21 Modern Operations and Disasters talk? <laughs> that was me. All right. What's this Airport 21 business? There's a little bit of history there, if, I, if I'm correct. Okay, so of course the title and and the abstract is is sort of clickbaity. Let's admit that. I mean, this is how you get people's attention. And and I wrote that talk, and I I first gave it at some uh, user group earlier this year. I don't actually remember which one it was. And so what it is, uh, Airport is a novel by an author called Arthur Haley written years ago and they made a movie out of that and that subsequently there was that was a kind of a boom of those disaster movies in the 90s right and basically it was airport and then a year and it would always be the newest available plane and then something really bad would happen and and big catastrophes mm -hmm. and that is kind of where the title comes from what the talk is that's it's uh, it's my attempt 
to basically it's it's teaching a lot about domain driven design and distributed systems and the problem with that is if you go with a very simple example that everybody understands uh, it's always not worth the effort because talking about a distributed event driven system with a very minimalistic example that kind of doesn't fit the problem is that everybody works in a different domain and nobody really can talk in depth about their domain publicly. Um, and so we have tried in trainings and workshops to kind of come up with an artificial domain and put up some rules. The problem is that that, that kind of doesn't work because people overinterpret the rules or make up weird rules and then you build a great piece of software and then somebody says yeah but what if and says something completely out of context and challenges your solution by that so i'm using i like using examples that everybody kind of knows and understands and like an airport i mean everybody has at some point in their life probably used an airport and traveled by airplane so you have some idea of what is going on and if you look at the different parts of an airport and all the logistics involved, um, that is kind of a very, very big distributed system. And it's a perfect place for explaining bounded contexts, right? Give so, us some examples. Well, somebody has to prepare the food. And the food has to be transported into the plane. And, and this is not just transporting arbitrary stuff from A to B because um, you have to um, adhere to certain limitations, right? You cannot, you have to put the food on the tray. It has to be a certain size. You have to put in more salt, less sugar. And then and it has to, well, have, has to have, has to fit into a certain budget. Then as you transport it, it obviously needs to be cooled. So you can't just take an arbitrary truck. And then if you want to enter the airport, there will be security considerations. So you can't just show up there with an arbitrary car and say, let me let me go in. So it's much more than just let's cook food and put it on the plane. And even with some, let's use DDD talk here, with some generic subdomain or some seemingly generic subdomain, there is also a lot, there's already a lot of flight related and air traffic related stuff in there. So that's the one part. And then of course, the other part is a bounded context well, think about the security area where you where you go in with your boarding pass and then where you go to the gates, right? And there are certain rules as to who can enter. And then there's, you, you can buy a bottle of Coke in there, but you can't bring that bottle of Coke inside, which is interesting. Can you, can you can pause for a moment, for a moment and uh, sure. just tell me what you mean precisely by bounded context? Ah, okay. So that is a that is a, a domain driven design term, which basically means let, let's let's stick with the airport example. Let's call it a subsystem. That that's not really the term. So the, the definition of bounded context is that's an, an area where one term has a certain meaning. Hmm. So think about one one department of an organization or one team. They will use a term like a product. What is a product? Carsten does e-commerce. If you, if you ask different people what a product is, they're gonna get different answers, right? If you ask some, some front-end developer, then the product is probably what I'm gonna display on the product detail page. If you ask some logistics person, that's a shelf space. If you talk about shipping, then it's what's the size of the box it fits into and are there any rules as to how I can send this? I think I understand and, because I work for a company called Platform. Yes, and all those all those people, if they talk about a product, they mean something completely different and they look from a different angle. But it's the same term. And the idea of a bounded context is to realize if person A talks about something and person B talks about something, and to them it's something different, then we should not mix those two things in one model, in one piece of software. So this is where bounded contexts start to align with the communication structure of your organization, enter Conway's law. And this is how you basically start to understand how a distributed system can look like and where to draw the boundaries. And again, coming back to the airport, if you give an example like an airport, 
everybody kind of knows that and everybody understands, yeah, you cannot just go into the secure area because there is a very clearly defined API on how to get in there. You cannot bypass that, right? And, and that helps people, I think, understand. So basically coming back to the talk, it's kind of a meta level talk where I talk about airports to give the people an idea and an image of things. So rather than say bounded context, read up in the blue book by Eric Evans, related to the concepts of that talk, which helps, I hope, the average developer to kind of not think about their terms, they are loaded and nobody really knows what that is in the software and then there's legacy issues and then there is a lot of complexity in their own company. And if you start using that as an example domain, people are always going to end up in, in actual problem discussions very soon. So taking an airport, which is kind of a neutral zone as a mental playground, that is basically what this talk is. Mm -hmm. Okay, and is the recording of that uh, and all of the talks, are those available? Will they be? Do you know? Beats me. I, I think, <laughs> um, I know that they have technically recorded them all. I don't know how and if they are going to, to make them public. Um, so effectively beats me. Um, it's certainly a talk that I will will repeat here and there and maybe at another conference or user group. So um, there's probably going to be, there's likely going to be a chance at some point to catch it if people are interested. Thank you. And um, back to just the conference in general, what was the attendance like? And was it a hybrid conference with some people joining remotely plus some people live? Yeah, maybe I can talk over. Um, yeah, definitely. So we was with the con hybrid concept um, by having live chats, and you always when we when we had the talk, there was also one person from the team um, checking the checking the chat, and uh, if there was a question, then um, asking the question for that person. So that uh, that went okay. I think it's it's a bit. I had at my one talk uh, the reduced boilerplate. I had a question from a from a. From the audience which i did not really understand i could not really understand and you could you cannot make a, a discussion then out of it you cannot right. really so i wasn't able to really answer that properly it was a bit unfortunate but yeah i think that's the downside but still um i think it's still better than uh yeah you have a bigger audience then this this is also cool so i think the concept is probably worth it and i as far as i know we will be able at least the attendance of the conference will be able to see that via this conference tool, how's it called, uh, swap card or so. And um, maybe they will also publish it via the German Entwickler.de mm. website, but this, uh, then of course, I'm not sure if there's also an English version, uh, version of that. So Good. as far as I know, and, and I'm definitely not uh, like a spokesperson for software and support who's organizing that conference, but we do have a relationship with them because we have, I, I think I basically speak at their conferences for 20 years now. And, and we frequently talk and we've always like interchanged ideas and they they want to hear our feedback and input and they, they also give us their view on the world. And I think what they essentially say right now is um, the pandemic was a kick in the... <clears throat> For us, because we really had to um, get out of our comfort zone, and it was hard work. But now we we can do hybrid conferences, and it's going to be our new default. So it's basically mm -hmm. always going to be somewhat hybrid with on on premise conference plus additional people can join in um, online, and also the option of having speakers or selected speakers talk remotely, which is kind of brilliant because. So often, uh, I mean, I, I do help out with a lot of call for papers and quite often you have that great talk by somebody from another continent. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, can the conference afford to fly those people over just to give one talk? That's really can the expensive. Can planet afford that? That's the other question. And that's a very good spin on that, right? Yeah. So I think there's a good opportunity also for newer speakers to kind of have a lightweight entry point into conferences and be be there remotely. 
I know for a speaker, the, the experience is not the same. And actually, the as Carsten said before, the remote speaking experience is yeah. is really really bad. We because the worst thing that happens is that yeah. once once you close the browser and you're suddenly back alone in your room, <laughs> and, and then it's, do I have no idea how many people watched and attended and how Did many it left. Anything? Wow, Did they really like it? Bad. So we definitely I, need I, some sort of camera like pointing to the audience as well as a speaker, and then you can at least get some some feedback yeah. i think there's going to be a lot of technology advances in the coming years and and i think what we are currently seeing is just basically what what we can do let's put it the other way if the pandemic happened five years ago we'd probably all be hit very hard because video conferencing was really not working as it worked last year so yeah i think we were lucky enough to be at this technology level so that it's it it became kind of viable to do sort of online conferences and now do more or less decent hybrid conferences. Yeah, imagine if we had had to go through 2020 not with Zoom but with Skype. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Carson, you mentioned uh, your reduced boilerplate code with PHP 8 talk. Uh -huh. What was that about, and how'd that go? Yeah, this was actually I just. Uh submitted that idea and didn't really expect it to be taken. But uh, at some point, yeah, it was quite... Is this, this, is this the conference equivalent of domain name registration? That's a cool domain. I'm just going to go register that in case. And then like you're sitting there and you have to do something with it. And then all of a sudden you find out you like your talk got accepted. Now you've got to write it. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I had, of course, I had a concept in mind. Um, it was just that... Yes, yeah, so the basic idea was that I had once this this feeling that uh, coming from PHP from the old days and writing really verbose code, a lot of doc blocks and putting everything in doc blocks and getter, setter and constructor and what what not you all have to do. And then with the recent PHP versions, of course, type declarations and, and all this nice stuff which has been added in PHP 8. Actually, and I showed in my example, you can reduce like this file to, to just a few lines, or every class to just a few lines. Uh, and then I made this, had this idea, okay, why should I, and really asking myself at some point, why should I still use private properties? Uh, um, why not use public properties? If, if the getter and setter is just doing nothing else than getting and setting the value. So I thought, okay, then why not? And with read-only properties, you can do a lot of uh, stuff that is it's really then you can achieve yeah, good, still still keeping up the good technique. And at that point, I showed to my example how I can reduce one, one sample DTO from, I don't know, was it 90 lines to five or so. So just by reducing all this rubbish code and still we did not lose any functionality. Yeah, it was absolutely the same. I had a little live coding session afterwards. So, and this was uh, awful. I think as, as everybody, I, I hate, when people watch me type, yeah, this is the worst. <laughs> but I, I said, okay, I have to go out of that comfort zone and do that once at least, because on the other hand, I like it when I see it, when I see it to others. And but that went quite well. I, luckily, I, I practiced it like five or ten times before I actually gave it, because otherwise, I would probably be uh, be pretty, yeah, in bad luck, so to say. Because then, of course, during my practices, something happened with I, which I did not anticipate right mm -hmm. and when you sit there in front of the audience and then you start mm -hmm. sweating uh, now we have an error probably when you just would be alone in your room and nobody would be watching you would immediately get it but then yeah so you know, there's two examples from my experience that go on both sides of that so the good example was uh <laughs> Um, the three of us were talking before we started the broadcast about our different styles of preparation and Stefan and I admitted to sometimes doing a little bit of night before type of preparation. And this was one of those cases in my history and I had actually written uh, a program to, that, okay, I'm gonna take, take a little bit of a tangent here. The, it was for a DrupalCon Denver and uh, the, the idea was that I wanted to do an a, a survey, a real-time survey of all of the people in the room. So I gave them a QR code and a URL that they could go to with their devices to take the survey and the results were going to come in in real time on, on projection. Um, you know, I had web sockets and JavaScript and cool stuff. Uh, and 
<laughs> at three in the morning the night before, I was like, I didn't filter my inputs. Somebody's going to XSS me on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so I got out of bed. I ran down to the hotel lobby to not wake my roommate up. And I, I quickly filtered my inputs on the, um, the, the, the Ajax form that I had built. Uh, to you know, trigger this poll that was going to make a tag cloud in real time of all the answers and all of that was going to be great. Of course, with the JavaScript and the browser those days at 3 a.m. I was using um, a big deal, you know, a big amount of alert statements <laughs> and <laughs> using you know very um, thoughtless language like. You stupid idiot! If it gets here, it's got to be wrong, or something like that, right? <laughs> the code execution should never come here, Robert. You stupid idiot! You know something like that in these alert statements, and fixed it. Got my inputs sanitized. Went back to bed. Did the presentation. Got to that point in there, and all of a sudden, every response from the entire audience triggered an alert on my screen, and it went. <gasps> <laughs> like you couldn't see anything alert. except the alert windows that all said, Robert, you stupid idiot, it should never do that. <laughs> so I had to like close all of those and then oh, like right. crack out, you know, VI because it was on a server someplace and like SSH in and like people loved it. I was like, I SSH into the server and I went and found that alert statement and you know, I had to like search in VI, you know. <laughs> like, I, I can I can tell you something. I think people really enjoy actual life coding. And yeah. I, I never do any prepared examples. I always do actual life coding when I do code live. And now here's the secret consultant's trick, right? As you build software, you, you build software, you deliberately do something which is not ideal or even wrong. And then you take it to the point where it becomes obvious, where it becomes a problem. And you say, oh, now we have this problem. Let's see how we can fix the problem. And then sometimes it's kind of let's backtrack. And you see, we did this, which led to that problem. Let's do this differently and see how that works out. So you're making the error a part of the learning process. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then when you're confused and you get a real error, usually what you say is, some and quite often it happens to me that someone from the audience then says, Yeah, you gotta fix that over there because you made a mistake. And then I usually respond by saying, You know, I just made that mistake to make sure that you're still awake. And that yeah, joke yeah. always works. <laughs> I respond with I owe you a beer. <laughs> cool. Okay, so so Carson, uh, I had a further question about what you actually said though. Um, so uh it made it sound a little bit like you were advocating for not using private uh, methods or things in your classes. Now, uh, my personal opinion is that like everything has its place and you have to know why you're doing what you're doing. And my personal understanding of private in object oriented anything is that it's when you don't trust your the users of your software to use something directly because of the complexity involved in the side effects that you can't document mm -hmm. in the API and yeah. things like that. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. I was done. Okay. <laughs> That's all yeah. I know. Uh, I'm, I'm I, reading I, I, it off the OOP website. So I think Carsten was referring to properties. And, and as far as I understood him, he was kind of advocating for with, with, Modern PHP, we technically don't have to write getters and setters because we could because use read only properties, make them public. So we know that nobody's changing them, which is the original problem with public properties. Mm -hmm. And I guess when it comes to code, that's a different story then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't really advocate anything because I, I always think this I'm I'm not the person who can tell others what what should be the best thing to do i just wanted to to raise the awareness of like look um because i, I saw this on myself i was using getters and setters just because i was used to it yeah it was yeah. like i'm That's doing kind it of because, a bad pattern because right? my ide tells me you know, i have a, a tool which can create uh the the things for me and that was like the, at some point just just you know make up your mind maybe step step a bit to the side and have another look if does it really make sense to do so or is it Especially for for the example which I had for the DTOs, which are not doing anything else than just 
passing data around. Why should mm -hmm. I do such a fuss and, and create more code than I actually need? Of course, there will always be good reasons that you will have private properties. Why not? It's uh, uh, not th this is uh, transparency. Transparency may be taken too far if you uh, do that. But you should still consider it. Also with the doc blocks, I mean, they served us well over the past many, many over many many years. But um, on the other hand, I, I always had this example, and I yeah, I had it in mind also doing it at the conference, but I didn't. Um, the thing was, I had a colleague at one company once, and yeah, he asked me, okay, Carsten, how does that function work? I, can you explain it to me? And this was always a sign that I write, wrote too long functions, but that's a, a different thing. Um, and then I said, yeah, look, just look at the code comment. I had a doc block there, and he was, oh, yeah, I had my, my IDE automatically collapse the doc blocks because they really disturbed me. And then he opened it and... Ah, okay, thank you. Ah, Never mind. Yeah, I this was like, code. okay. Amazing. But then this was also some initial thing for me thinking, okay, maybe DocDocs are not the best place to put all the nice information there, right? So this is kind of learning back in the days. And uh, when you don't need, when you don't use them anymore, yeah, you have to make up your mind and really try to make short functions, self-explanatory functions, etc. Self-explaining code, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And this and, is- And you have, to, you have to admit that with PHP 8, I mean, I think with the exception of throws, everything that you we used to express in doc blocks as in annotations now can be expressed at the language level, which is, of yeah. course, a lot better because it, it is enforced by the language. Um, so great. And then there is some doc blocks that may add additional values by describing an array data structure, something like that. That's true. Mm. But but aside from that, there is no real value in still having doc blocks around if they are redundant with the code. Because, I mean, if, if the doc block does not reflect what the code says, well, who is right by definition the code? So that kind of makes the doc block superfluous. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, in fact, I think that a lot of developers just have the pattern of let their IDE auto-generate them. Yeah. Now with PHP 8, you really can, can rethink that practice and mm -hmm. maybe not do the doc blocks by default at least i mean if if you feel that there is something important that you need to put in a comment well go ahead yeah, yeah. No, did I, you get I, any feedback on the yeah on the i was i had a nice uh, nice answer or a nice remark from somebody who said okay if i start doing this now and i uh, create a pull request out of it what would happen and how can i convince others that this is not complete rubbish what i'm doing so that's what i found quite interesting so I think the general notion was most of the, the people uh, who responded to me were like basically on the same side. Yeah, really. Uh, I think I really made some people think, and this is of course what I intended to do. Not not telling anybody what to do, but at least ask yourself: Do, do you really need it? And this is all I want to do. Um, and I think for the doc blocks, uh, one feature I still think would be useful on language level would be de uh, deprecated to to mark functions deprecated or to make. Yeah, this this would be one yeah. thing which probably who knows PHP. Let's I let's add that one to the list of useful ones. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So there are a few, but not many anymore. With attributes as well, we can really um, now skip them. Hopefully, at some point. Yeah. yeah the P the PHP Renaissance is um, complete. <laughs> so Stefan, you gave a second talk as well, um, and that one was called, if I'm right, <laughs> Legacy Software, Seven Myths, Three Reasons, One Goal. That also sounds somehow epic. It's like a movie title. Yeah. Um, so I once read that if you want to get read on the internet, if you write a blog post, then the headline has to be something like, seven things that you need to know or or something like that and you know that seven is the magic number that's the, the the amount of things that we can kind of memorize at the same point and whatever seven is one of my lucky numbers but let us cite that you have more than one lucky number that's lucky in and of itself it's, most it's of actually, us have to like have one lucky number it's, it's actually seven and one but that that's beside the point here okay so, <laughs> what this is is um the, the one goal is, hey, let's make working with legacy software fun again, because legacy software is there. It will always be there. And let's face it, most people that have the job title developer are more maintainers. And I'm saying this without judgment. It's just mm -hmm. an observation. We spend an awful lot of time maintaining legacy code. And mm -hmm. I think as 
as the, as a planet, we will not be able to afford to rewrite everything from scratch all over again and build new solutions just because we can. If you look at a city, it's going to have old houses. It's going to have ugly houses. It's going to have some really old, ugly houses where if you look at them, you say, I wouldn't want to live there. But they still exist, and we cannot afford to just take them away. So we have to deal with the legacy. And the seven myths is basically a bunch of things where people say, well, this is one of the reasons why why uh, I can I have a problem with legacy, or this is one assumption that people make. I want all seven, please. Makes it sorry. I want all seven myths. You can give me the bullet point version, but I, I I'm going to, I'm going to count. <laughs> Do you really think I can remember them? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, if That's not, I I, 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 I also time. trust that you can make them up on the spot again. If if you can, I can remember okay, them, I can, and we never give know you, the difference. I can give you some of them, but if okay, uh, okay let's. Like, so number one is I think was we need a REST API. Mm -hmm. And oh, I usually do. question that and say, okay, so what what is your intention? What do you need it for? Because a REST API frequently leads to distributed monoliths with a lot of runtime coupling, right? Mm -hmm. And there are other ways of doing things. REST is great for content delivery, but for sending commands, maybe another kind of API also suffices. So that's basically CQRS thinking here. If we separate the the ways we handle commands and content retrieval, actually everything becomes a lot simpler or simplified. Okay, number two. Um, I don't, I don't, I will not get the sequence right. Uh, I'll try to get, you're not, you're now really putting me on the spot here. Okay, uh -huh. use relational databases. Um, and so there are other, let, talk about polyglot persistence, talk about alternative NoSQL technologies like search engines. Don't use your relational database for like full text search stuff, but put the search engine next to the existing application. So a lot of things I'm talking about is basically hinting at, you know, you can solve problems outside legacy and put software next to legacy. You just have to make those two parts work together. Mm -hmm. um, I really have to dig up my slides now because... <laughs> so well, number, number seven was the earth is flat. And then I said, no, that's a joke. There are silver bullets. And I said, no, that's a joke. Um, we cannot have event sourcing. That's one of my favorite architectural topics of the last years. And I said, well, yes, you can. And, and I have another presentation that I'm linking to showing you how you can introduce event sourcing in existing legacy applications. What, what do you mean by event sourcing? OK, I got there in, in one sentence. So event driven is something that most people understand nowadays it's sending communicating events it's essentially having something like kafka everybody loves kafka mm -hmm. got to be kafka so you're sending events and an event says something has happened and then another piece of software can react on this event yes. that's what we've always been doing in ui right there is an event and then you're reacting through an event handler and if you take that at the domain level you have an event driven application now, you realize that if the events describe what is happening in the world, then basically you can at some point start using the events to build state. So if you want to know how the world looks right now, you can look at the events that happen and say, well, if we take that initial state, initial state and then apply the state changes that those events have introduced, then we have a current state which has been built from events and that is event sourcing. Uh -huh. Now, the middle part is if you, I mean, everybody in the cloud basically builds event driven some things. And, and it has been agreed that kind of event driven is the way of attaching other cloud services to existing software that seems to be accepted, right? And then you still have local or central storage where you store state. And that causes friction because what if the state in the database does not reflect what the sequence of events says? Well, who is right? So at some point you realize, well, if I have that sequence of events that I'm reacting to, and if I do what I just described, which is the definition of event sourcing, I can build state to make decisions or to create projections, which is views from events, I don't need an additional storage. So the event log becomes my source of truth. 
that is a monolithic blockchain, if you want. So to I throw knew that word was going to come up. <laughs> <laughs> the whole I mean, replaying to get to the current state that just, you know, you had to go there. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, so we got kind of through the seven myths. We got the one goal. What were the three reasons? The three reasons. I didn't write that is number one. And then I rephrase that to who who the fuck would do no sorry who who would do that? And then it says actually what you have to say is I don't understand this. Because it's blame free and neutral. And it says, look, I'm looking at that code, I don't understand it. Can somebody explain it to me? Can we work it out together? Or can and then can we make the code more explicit so that it communicates its its intent, its intent, which is one way of improving legacy software over time. Once you've understood something, make changes to the code by improving the naming, by introducing additional explanatory methods just to communicate your understanding of what it does and why it does that. And and get rid of any unnecessary getters and setters. Well, don't don't get me don't get me started on those. <laughs> My firm rule is you never write a setup, period. And that's my ground rule because I basically want immutable objects. Mm -hmm. So I want to initialize the objects through the constructor and then that object state should be immutable because mutable object state is, is far more difficult to handle. Mm -hmm. And if you and I think we learned that from functional programming that immutability is really a great concept. So I very much um, cherish that. So that means you don't need setters. Of course, you will have mutators telling your object to change its state, but do not do that by calling, saying set active true, but name the method enable whatever, show the product in the store now, whatever that may be. So use explicit naming. Mm -hmm. Getters, basically, you, don't, you only need for DTOs. And, and the interesting question is if you think uh, along the lines of CQRS and separate projections, AKA views from commands, then you have objects that make decisions and they only need very little amounts of data. And then you have the views that need largest amount of data, but they don't make this, that don't make decisions and you don't have to enforce rules here. So actually that leads to the question, do I need objects for that in the first place? Mm. Because in the database, I have some structure. I'm going to load that in PHP typically. Then it's an array or an array of arrays. And then it's easy to convert that to JSON and to send it to the client. And the client's going to display that. So why would you need an object in between there? Doesn't really make sense. So that's why I think you don't need any getters because on the command side, on the objects that do make decisions, you're not going to ask them for state because they make a decision which then is going to be documented by emitting an event. And so there is no reason to ever ask a command for its state. So you also don't need a getter on that side. But you, you're kind of pushing me to put like eight hours of lecture into that one talk here. I mean, I enjoy <laughs> that, but I think we are covering- That's my job, the come on, here. I'm supposed to. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so we, we kind of got through all seven myths and three reasons. Yeah, we did. We goal. didn't, but I really I'd really have to dig them up, and I think okay. it, it, <laughs> That's it, fine. it would take us too much time to to actually go through all of them. And I do want to get to the fourth but, talk. But I, I do. Yeah. I, we do. We do publish the slides, so everybody is welcome to visit our website. I think I have to convert them and upload them. Uh, but they are going to be published there. And if you just go to talks.thephp.cc, there is a bunch of talks and you can download them as PDF or click through them online. And for some, we even have videos. So uh, everybody is welcome to just stop by and, and find out what the seven myths are that I couldn't even remember today. Fantastic. Thank you. So there was um, a fourth talk given um, by Karsten, which was also the keynote of the conference isn't that right uh, on wednesday there were uh, three keynotes okay so the wednesday keynote mm -hmm. um and it was called coding against climate change sustainable software engineering which uh mm -hmm. definitely is a topic that uh, is a zeitgeist topic definitely also essential uh, to talk about was it 
was the topic uh, enthusiastically received as a as a topic by the audience? And and what did you actually say? <laughs> well, the, how it was received? I mean, I got, I got some nice feedback, and uh, yeah, the the, the audience uh, was not really enthusiastic, so no standing ovations, unfortunately. Also, we uh, the the I think everybody was a bit calm. And, and uh, you hardly could get anyone bit laughing, for example, when you had a little joke. I had some jokes on the slides, maybe that uh, like a commander data, what they called the dark data, which is like evil eyes and stuff like that. So, or maybe it was just funny. But um, anyways, I'm, I'm going away. Um, so the, my, my talk was basically planned a little bit differently. So I actually wanted to go more on a technical level. Then I heard from the organizers that... It was a keynote, and I thought, uh, we'll get the keynote, and I thought, okay, right, that's cool. Then let's do it a bit more keynote way and going a bit more the meta level. So I started with um, first, yeah, going pretty quickly through the actual problem. I felt I should still explain it, although I was hoping everybody got it by now. Then, yeah, sharing how much we actually as developers or how the, the ICT, the information and communication technology, is part of the problem. It's, it's not that big when you compare it to other to others um, but it's still there right so yeah. we do have our share on the whole problem and i think we we are morally obliged to to check what we as developers can do and this was really one thing which is, i think especially during corona when you had enough time to think maybe sitting there in the winter and uh, they really get me started thinking what can i do not just changing my personal lifestyle but also what can i do in my profession I had a talk there with a colleague on, uh, at KW who said, look, I, I don't like that we sell plastic products. And I said, yeah, okay, but we cannot change the business model now. We are working in this company and it's a good company. And I also like to receive my goods from e via e-commerce. I do it a lot, right? It's it's fantastic, basically. <laughs> so I said, but then I had, we had together had this idea, what can we then as developers do? And then I started like, after that talk I had with my colleague, I started like doing some research and I found this, this whole topic of sustainable software engineering. It's, I'm, I'm not sure if this is really even a real definition by now, but it's getting a thing somehow, green IT, whatever you might call it. Um, we talk about green hosting. I've had uh, shows on this series about that topic. Yeah, that's that's exactly one thing, and uh, this led me exactly to the next topic. Well, of course, you can say, look, uh, we as developers, we, yeah, we just require energy, right? This is what keeps our software going, and then why not just switch to renewable energy, screen hosting? That is, of course, a good thing. Yeah, don't get me wrong, but the problem is, of course, we we try to, then, for example, in Germany, we have roughly nowadays the half of the energy is created during renewables, which is cool, but the other half is still fossil fuels and yeah and principally very dirty brown german coal from really near where i live i see yeah. those coal mines every time i fly out of the Köln bahn airport and it's like these gouging gaping holes yeah, in it's... mother earth where and villages and were displaced to get the coal yeah. out i would say that the green energy is is basically completely used up by deutsche bahn who at least <laughs> claims to use all green energy and all the hosting data centers that have I've researched basically all claim to use green energy and that probably amounts to roughly 50 percent I'm guessing here yeah. but I'm, I'm joking but the point I'm no, trying no. to make is I, I think there are so many people who claim to use green energy and I don't know but whether we actually have that much green energy exactly that's the point exactly that was my point um so we, we need to work, of course, hard to, to create more, uh, to use more renewable energy, and we have to provide it. And th this is not that easy, as you might think. We cannot just put uh, wind turbines everywhere or like solar panels everywhere. This is this is a big problem. And um, then we also want to decarbonize more industries. We want to use electric cars. We want to decarbonize the chemical industry, which is very energy intensive. Uh, and this comes on top. Yeah. So what do we do? Uh, and then, the, uh, of course, renewable energies are not very reliable. The next day, it's maybe cloudy, maybe not so much wind. 2020 was a pretty less wind than the years before, so there was less wind energy. What do you do there? Of course, this gap has to be filled also with uh, fossil fuels, right? This, uh, then the mostly gas turbines kick in, or we import um, 
the energy from outside of, of Germany. So this is not really, it, it, it has to be done, but it's short term, not, not the solution. So the only conclusion I had was then let's try to reduce as much as, as we can our energy consumption. And, and then I gave examples like uh, split it a bit up. Uh, so there's of course carbon offsetting, which when many com companies nowadays say we are carbon neutral, that doesn't not mean that they're not producing any carbon anymore. They're just paying other co companies to plant, let's say trees in some poor country. Uh, and by that, getting themselves green, but they're not reducing their, their carbon right. emissions. And this is a huge problem. And this is also a moral problem because you're taking away fertile land in these poor countries from farmers sometimes they're good and bad examples of course right so not not all of these companies are doing bad things but it's also not the only solution to the only solution we have and yeah so looking at the time i'm, I'm trying not to give the full talk you know <laughs> so basically i just said let's let's reduce what we can let's reduce the, we have to reduce data storage for example because hard drives have to be built they have to be hosted in the data center air conditioned etc so the more when you look at some S3 buckets, maybe at AWS, and you see there are terabytes of data which nobody uses anymore. They still have to be stored somewhere and, and kept alive. And uh, many other examples. And uh, in the end, it goes like really, let's let's try to see what we can do. And also, um, I gave this example of Windows 11, which uh, what yeah, was has now thing? Windows 11. Oh, Windows 11, yes. Yeah, so which which basically has a some sort of uh, list allowing some CPUs to use that. But if you don't have that kind of CPU, you will not be able to use it anymore. I'm not saying we should use Windows 11 all the time, but if you want to, then you, you probably need to buy a new device. And that's bad because then you uh, also, then, and this is the concept of embodied carbon, where you say the laptop nowadays maybe does not consume so much energy. It's very efficient, right? So looking at mine here, it's maybe six watts or something. That's not much, but the production process is, is crucial here. So you during the production, you admit for a standard class laptop, 500 kilograms of uh, carbon. So this this is a very much, and we should that try to easy. use- That's so much. Yeah, and, and we should really try to use these devices longer. So if we calcul calculatory, when you say I use it for three years, it's 170 kilograms per year. If I use it for five years, it's 100 kilograms per year. So the longer you, you we use the devices, the better, basically. Uh, not for the economy, maybe. This is a different thing, which I didn't cover, of course. Uh, everybody wants to sell the new uh, smartphone every year. Mm -hmm. But uh, we should really try to, to get around that. And also write software, which is not consuming so much, like Windows 11. It's five, the, the ISO is five gigabytes, which is, uh, it's just an operating system, which would actually keep our software running, right? Nothing more. I don't want more from that. As if I needed any more reasons why I'm not using Windows 11. There, I've got two more to my <laughs> already very long list of reasons yeah. why I'm not using Windows it's 11. Of, it's, of course, <laughs> easy bashing Windows, right? But I could have also made the Android example. Android is sometimes yep. even even bigger. I saw examples from people having 10 gigabytes in their systems folder. But For smartphone... Huh? Coming coming back to something that we discussed earlier with the with the NPM versus Composer and the amount of stuff that you download, I, I think I heard you say uh, that we should also try to minimize the amount of software that that we write or that exists to kind of execute what what needs to be done. Did I did I understand you correctly there? I mean, reducing the amount of data stored. Yes, um, I got that. Yeah, but so, mm -hmm. it's also. How much system resources, how much CPU do we use to process one HTTP request? Yeah, I, I had mean, this example. Yeah, I had this example also in my frameworkless talk, which I gave this summer. So I had a really very basic PHP application, which but this which did exactly the same than an application I set up upon Lumen. Uh, like Lumen was I don't know six six thousand files versus one file. What's basically. Lumen? Lumen is the microservice framework from Laravel. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so, so it's uh, it was even the lightweight version of Laravel, which was still like six thousand files, uh, thirty megabytes, and and stuff like that. Versus my little tiny file, which was times faster, times easier to maintain and stuff. So yeah, now imagine all the the build pipelines, for example. When we build, uh, we, every time we download the software from the internet, every time we have huge Docker containers nowadays. 
the infamous node modules folder, right? And all this stuff which gets, if you don't do efficient caching, gets downloaded over and over again. So yes, I think this this is at least where we should go. Uh, try to make, I mean, the, the devices are getting more and more powerful nowadays. Still, the software feels kind of sluggish to me sometimes, right? Maybe and we should put a star rating on the Docker container size. One gigabyte, one star. <laughs> two to five star because no really nobody nobody looks at that and okay. if you look at the size of containers and then it's just hidden somewhere where, yeah. where nobody looks but it's it's a gigantic piece of software mm -hmm. that gets pulled and rebuilt and 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 we layer on top and it it, it is pulled into memory to execute it even if we don't use the parts <laughs> we have to be clear on that mm -hmm. and and so the the more Big Docker containers we 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 instantiate the bigger service we're gonna need. So there we are back to Carsten's point again. Absolutely. And we're going to leave it at that point. The hour is up. We have uh, used all the time that we have available for this episode. Thank you so much, Karsten and Stefan, for being my guests and bringing the uh, From the Ground report on the uh, uh, International PHP Conference in Munich to, to me and to our audience. Um, thank you, audience, for tuning in. Um, give your feedback, any questions you have uh, in all the comments, wherever you're watching this. And tune in next week for another episode of Deploy Friday. Thank you so much. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Oh, I have to push the button to end the broadcast. <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm doing it. <laughs>